Yeah, I go by three. Uh, uh, I'm a veterinarian. Uh, uh, my training is in microbiology and veterinary pathology. Uh, I'm located here in Tifton, Georgia, which is a sub-campus of U University of Georgia. We have a uh, full service, all species diagnostic laboratory, and which means we do everything related to diagnosis and uh, and surveillance of infectious diseases for the state of Georgia. Normally, these are the animals we see, um, but we see all kinds of animals. You know, anything from a fish to an alligator or a kangaroo. Leptospira, I think I really like Leptospira because it's really beautiful, but that's not the only reason I work with it. Um, when I started my career as a veterinary diagnostician, um, it was very, very difficult to diagnose Leptospirosis. All the diagnostic tests available, it was challenging, and the disease is very challenging because of the wide spectrum. And the diagnostic tests, as Albert said, they, they are. We don't have very good diagnostic tests. So anyway, what I learned, you know, when John Prescott, he wrote a book review about leptospirosis. So he said, OK, most leptospirologists lie, die mad because of the complexity of the organism. Then I went to the ILS meeting at um, Merida, Mexico. And Dr. Adler, he said, looking at all the leptospirologists, he said, they live and die mad. Right, Albert? <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> Unfortunately. <yes. laughs> so it, it is very, very complex disease. I'm, I'm not going to touch any of these. In companion animals, just like humans, uh, it's a sporadic, permanent illness leading to complications such as renal and hepatic failure. And it's most co commonly reported in dogs. And there are occasional cases in cats. Cats are uh, resistant to leptospirosis. In livestock, it's mainly a disease of production and reproduction. Uh, mainly in cattle, um, Leptospira, Bok, Fetus, and I, Thirova, Harjo causes uh, early embryonic death, which leads to uh, economic loss. And sometimes, uh, Leptospirosis can cause mastitis. Uh, there are sporadic uh, acute fulminant disease in cattle, uh, like uh, in humans and dogs. And horses, most cases, are abortion storms uh, due to septicemia or leptospiral infection. And the recurrent uveitis is another problem uh, seen in horses. Uh, in, ho in swine, in domestic swine, all the cases we see are associated with reproductive loss. In wild animals, we really don't know the actual burden of disease, but a lot of wild animals can act as carriers of uh, reservoirs of this um, bacteria. So over 250 serovas, 24 zero groups, and approximately 20 species, and we have unlimited reservoir animals. And environmental maintenance of this organism makes it really, really complicated to understand and um, implement any kind of control measures in animal. So if somebody asks me about a disease who, where this one health problem could be applied to, I would say it's leptospirosis, because it can affect uh, humans, companion animals, livestock, wild animals, everything, and they circulate among all these species. So these are the known um, maintenance hosts. Uh, these are, this is actually really old information. I am not sure whether we can see Can coli anymore in dogs. Um, Pomona, maybe pigs. Um, cat will get uh, sporadic infections. Gripotyphosa, that's the most common zero war we see in dogs these days. And Harjo, of course, it's endemic in cattle population in the region. And I haven't seen a hemorrhagia yet. Bratislava, which is really prevalent, it's a very difficult zero war to isolate. and. Uh, it's very prevalent in horses and swine population. So some of the images of Leptospira, actually, this is an electron microscope. People who haven't seen it, it's a spiral organism. And one thing, it's a motile organism. It can, um, you know, it can travel fast. And maybe that's related to its pathogenesis. It can be related to its pathogenesis and its transmission capabilities. 
and this is actually an image of microscopic agglutination test which is still a gold standard for diagnosing leptospirosis. And uh, that is uh, how we grow leptospira. Uh, you can see that dinger zone and in the liquid media you can see turbidity and sometimes we can try to go in solid media but uh, due to contamination we don't have much left. And I have learned that we can stain it with some of the aniline dyes you can in like Victoria blue you can see the organism. So uh, this is one cluster of case I have seen uh, during my career and uh, uh, a puppy, one girl bought a puppy from a hawk festival which is hawk festivals are very common in uh, southern Georgia. So uh, brought a puppy home and uh, puppy became ill and she took it to the veterinarian. Apparently she told me that uh, it had very yellow mucous membrane which is jaundice. Veterinarian didn't think it was leptospirosis, he thought it was something else and puppy died and then three other dogs become ill. So the only thing we see when you look at the blood picture we see high creatinine and uh, blood urea nitrogen and neutrophilia, that's the only thing we see. And then um, he calls me and he, he asked me about all these, I told maybe we should test for leptospirosis. So he um, euthanized the dog actually because a lot of times it's an instead kidney and uh, he um, sent uh, a piece of kidney and urine and serum and it was positive for FA and PCR and also MAT. So the other dog uh, became ill and actually he called me and told me so I went and collected the carcass of that dog and he euthanized the animal. So that's what happens when a dog gets leptospirosis, uh, severe renomegaly and then uh, severe interstitial nephritis actually that kidney is, you know, actually gone there. And they also develop severe ascites. Um, that's how they look in the uh, you know, fluorescent antibody staining technique. That's an intact organism there. And uh, if you look at the histopathology, then um, you can see all the tubules will be whacked out and then a uh, lot of inflammation in the kidney. And that's an immunohistochemistry. I have a better image. You can see antigen everywhere in the tubules and in the interstitium, um, in the you know all the phagocytic cells. So uh, the common te diagnostic tests we use in the veterinary labs are microscopic agglutination tests on serum, and we do FA and PCR on urine, blood, and tissue. Usually when I talk to a client, we tell them to submit serum and urine and blood so that we can do a combination of tests because the di successful diagnosis depend on the stage of infection. So you want to get all these samples to get accurate results. So as uh, Albert said, it's a treatable disease, it's a preventable disease if you try to, and but it's a more standard diagnosed disease even in the veterinary field. Um, and uh, among animals also 15 per maybe 15 percent of the incidental infections develop complications. So we do have some vaccines in the veterinary field uh, for uh, dogs. There is like a 3-0-R um, vaccine and uh, the I don't know. That's what I said. Um, you know, maybe from the secretions and excretions, they, these were playing together, these dogs. So they might be licking urine or drinking urine, something like that. We really don't know about the transmission or actual disease burden in animals. Maybe, you know, they all play together, lick each other, so we really don't know the transmission. That's something we need to study. Among all the animal species, we really don't know that. But uh, the and also the vaccines are species specific. There is one vaccine for cattle and there is one vaccine for, one or two vaccines for dogs. Actually, um, you know, the, all these vaccines are suboptimal. We have to vaccinate, do yearly vaccinations. Um, and the, it's a disease of great economic impact in uh, dairy cattle because, and beef cattle because of the um, um, reproductive issues. Sorry to no problem. Yes, yes, yeah. 
it's hard to find the reference. Right. There, there are in, enough studies to find the actual e economic impact of uh, animal leptospirosis, especially in the cattle population. Um, that's something, you know, I have been writing grants to figure out. <laughs> but then, um, of course, it's, it has public health impact, but I haven't really heard, seen a case, um, actually a true case in human beings in that region. Um, Can I ask one question? When you see abortions from horses or reproductive problems mm -hmm. in pigs, where are you seeing concentration of leptospirosis? Uh, most of these cases are diagnosed by microscopic evaluation tests. Some of the cases they look at placenta and then they can see the organism in the placenta as well as in the fetal kidneys and liver. So basically maybe fetus is developing septicemia, you know, and they, they yeah. Right. So uh, one thing, I did uh, a group of studies in uh, southern Georgia to actually look at the prevalence of this organism. Um, one thing, when I ask uh, veterinarians, okay, do you see leptospirosis? They say no, or it, it's not, it doesn't exist because it's a disease of past. That's what they say. So I thought maybe I should start a small prevalence study to see how, you know, why they are saying that. Uh, sometime back, this was a flyer from Pfizer, now it's Soitis, and uh, they were talking about leptospira, both Peter and I, hard job always. Um, in uh, cattle population, and they were talking about again about the economic impact of um, this organism, and they were promoting vaccination with the Leptospira bovis petersoni. So I thought maybe I should start with dairy cattle and in the region. So basically, I wanted to know whether it's affecting reproduction. Uh, I looked at ten dairy farms in the region, and uh, based on talk, somebody told me it's like fifteen percent prevalence of leptospirosis. So we decided to go with thirty cows in each herd, and uh, we looked at ten, fifteen open cows and fifteen um, pregnant cows to see whether there is a problem with reproduction. We did mat and um, micro uh, fluorous and antibody staining technique. This is actually a urine from one of those cows, very nice intact organisms. Do you know that none of these cows were vaccinated? Uh, yes, I, I know vaccinated farms. There were three farms which were vaccinated and seven farms which were not using a vaccine for leptospirosis. And these three farms, they were not using the same vaccine, they were using different vaccines. So anyway, what we found is seven out of ten farms were positive. They had at least one cow FA positive, which means there are more, a lot more cows which are positive. And each, uh, all of the herds had uh, at least one cow with microscopic agglutination titer greater than 100. So uh, regarding the reproductive impact, uh, I think the sample size wasn't enough, but we found um, some degree of uh, problem with uh, open, you know, cows. They they had more uh, leptospirosis than leptospira infection than uh, pregnant cows. The other thing we notice is as the animal ages, I think they are getting rid of leptospira slowly. They are negative, you know, among pregnant cows. And the open cows were postpartum, or were they open because they aborted? Uh, they are open because they are not conceiving. You know, they have early embryonic death and they expel the embryo and they come back to heat, you know, often. So uh, they remain open for several cycles, I think. And then, um, you know, it's, it was not a great study, but, you know, those farms were located uh, in different parts of Georgia. So I thought, yeah. Can I ask you a question? There's a national animal health uh -huh. and they sort of supported by the uh, farming industry, mm -hmm. but run by the USDA, and if they, that would seem to be a good place to try and get uh, data for leptospirosis, uh, at least for the prevalence, because they sample animals from everywhere in different sampling schemes by herd samples. I think that's a good idea to maybe ask them to share samples and or maybe start a surveillance program on leptospirosis. I think it exists with the feral swine. So they do uh, do surveillance on feral swine for leptospirosis. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent idea. I think they, <coughs> I don't know if, you're, if you know that, but it's very systematic 
sampling representative and, and they do this in, uh, every, can you see it? You know, every number of years. It will be great. I think it's, it's again, just like as we deal with lepto on the public health side, mm -hmm. right, it's priority. Yeah, you know, it, it's yeah it has all these reproductive effects, I think they want it out. Uh, and also, it's because of vaccination, you know, it's, it's common practice. So it will kind of make this complicated this interpretation. But, and yeah. also, they have priority diseases. Oh, That's know. one they, <laughs> they want to look for, you know. <laughs> We tried to get Coxie out the other guy. Out right, there. right. It's no, you look at to <laughs> <laughs> because it's in all, in all the milk, right? <laughs> so, correct me if I'm wrong. Lepsospirosis is not a reportable disease here in the United States. No, uh, I think it's becoming a reportable disease in humans now, yeah. right? No, no, no. But in animals, no, no, in cows. no. And so, in order to trade a cow from one part to another part, you don't have to be tested for no, lepsospirosis. No, not That's, at all. So, I'm, I'm correcting that. Yeah. So I think the assertion is, is that farmers don't want to know. Yeah. That, that no. There are certain areas where farmers do not want to know. Yeah. But generally, farmers are interested in leptospirosis because you know my, all my funding came from dairy producers. They are they are the one who funded me to look at all these do all these studies. Yeah, I think because of the reproductive. Yeah, the reproductive impact of the disease, and there is not a good vaccine. That's one reason. Uh, then I thought maybe I should look at the beef herds, and um, for that I started collecting kidneys from abattoirs, and those that kidney uh, or the cattle kidney, it has so many lobes. Sometimes I get really confused which lobe to collect to look for leptospirosis. <laughs> it's it's really hard. Um, so we did um, a dark field FA culture and PCR. Basically, I collected one to two kidneys per week to process it carefully so that I can isolate the organism because it's really hard to isolate Leptospira. Um, so uh, this is the result. And uh, dark field and DFA, I don't, uh, I don't know how specific they are. Uh, but PCR and culture, very specific. And I had 11 PCR positive, And um, actually, I have now four isolates from um, beepers. And all of them turned out to be Leptospira bo, Peters and I, Hajo bovis. Um, also, I put one of the isolate in the hamsters, and this strain is not very virulent. It doesn't kill hamsters. Uh, I did 10 to the 7 organism, and it just went and sat in the kidneys and produced all these tubular necrosis and interstitial nephritis. So next uh, study I undertook, OK, maybe I should look into other animal population to see whether there is zero prevalence, because I don't have any, you know, um, I can get any kidneys from these animals. So I started looking at the serum from different groups of animals. Horses, uh, we get large number of serum for testing for e is equine infectious anemia. So I took all those serums. These are normal horses. And canine, uh, we get um, serum from sick animals to do the clin clinical pathology testing. And domestic and feral swine, we do some regulatory surveillance testing for brucellosis and pseudorabies. So I took some samples from that lot. And cats also from the clin path, uh, um, clinical pathology section. So um, I, I see quite a good zero prevalence in animal population, and the horses had the highest, followed by feral swine and uh, domestic swine and uh, can, uh, canines. I saw only very background titers in cats. Um, also, when I looked at the zero, and horses are not vaccinated for leptospira, so there is not a horse vaccine. We see very high prevalence for um, Radislava. That's titus above 100. This covers that. But this one, I took all the animals with titus above 400. Um, you know, I think above 400 is a significant exposure titer. So, you know, a large number of animals had, uh, you know, some animals had Bratislava um, titus above 400. So, uh, it, it is um, prevalent. You know, the exposure is at least prevalent in horse population. And feral swine, again, same thing, Bratislava is the most uh, uh, prevalent zero war. Same thing uh, with domestic swine, um, again, Bratislava. Dogs, 
I'm not sure how good is this data because some of the dogs are vaccinated with leptospiral vaccine. Um, you see, uh, this, this is included in the vaccine, that is included in the vaccine, and also Gripotyphosa is included in the vaccine. But one, one case uh, from this group, it had a very, very high titer, around 3,600. So I went back and looked at the case history of this particular case, and it was submitted for, um, it, it had PUPD, which means it had renal, some kind of renal problem. So the veterinarian thought it might be endocrine disorder, so they submitted for adrenal testing. So actually it was probably a recovered animal, leptospirosis recovered animal. So it had renal problems, chronic renal problems. Cats, I don't know how good this is, but uh, you know, they had only background titers. But um, so it's widely distributed, and these blue areas are the places where they hold feral swine. They catch it from different parts of the state and bring it to these holding facilities, and uh, they test it for um, brucella and PRV, and then take it to hunting areas to for uh, recreation, recreational hunting. So when you look at the map of Georgia, you know this is this is actually the poverty belt, and uh, you know it's. Leptospirosis is distributed, the zero prevalence you can see all over Georgia. But it's a very, very small study. And again, uh, I thought maybe I should look at some wild animals too. Um, so I asked a licensed trapper to submit the carcasses he has, um, he captures. So I looked at a uh, few, very few animals, and they were all supposed to. And one of these opossum has a, had a really bad, bad kidney. Uh, and with severe interstitial nephritis and uh, tubular necrosis. And probably that's the best silver stained leptospira I ever have seen. So in the, this region, really, we have a subtropical climate, a very high annual precipitation rate, and about 80,000 pounds in that region. You know, a lot of water. Kids play in the water. You know, people do a lot of recreation activities. And uh, we have a high density of animal agriculture and a very rich wild animal population. And we have a very large uh, wild field crop, crop industry and ecotourism. We have so many swamps such as O'Keefe, Noki, and all those. And people do water recre related recreational activities very often. And uh, these are some of the reports came out recently uh, about a spike in um, canine leptospirosis in Florida. It was couple, uh, maybe a month back. And so I, I really think it's um, uh, leptospira is endemic in uh, animal populations in our region. I think uh, we need uh, better studies. So we have abundant response. reservoir host, right environment, and you know which will favor continued replication and maintenance of the organism. And we have susceptible population and. Uh, you know, that's enough to cause disease. So I really think uh, the reason I'm here, I'm not a modeler, I'm not a mathematician. I would like to, you know, probably develop more studies in the region to look at the transmission cycles and, you know, prevalence and the disease spectrum in animals in the region.